Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It's Tuesday night, and that means it's time for our favorite hour of the week, Friends in Fiction. Tonight, we are so thrilled to introduce you to killer thriller writer Jeffrey Deaver. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah, we saw that. We noticed. <laughs> oh, I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. <laughs> yes, you are. Yes, you are. And I'm oh, Patty Collins. I'm Patty Collins. <laughs> Off to a good start, ladies. Off Starting to a good start already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Patty Callahan Henry. <laughs> and I'm Kristen Ramel. I swear we've done this before. Yeah. But and we've discovered it in seven times. Okay. I mean, Mary Kay's gone for five minutes and we've totally fallen apart. Totally fall apart. I know. I know. <laughs> this is Friends in F Fiction for New York Times bestselling <laughs> authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores. Our guest for the evening is Jeffrey Deaver, whose latest novel, The Midnight Lock, was recent re recently released, and we cannot wait for you to meet him. We also wanted to let you know that we'll miss Mary Kay tonight as she had another obligation and had to miss tonight's show, but she will be back next week. And she says she's sorry to miss Jeffrey Deaver, um, but I'm sure she'll uh, she'll be tuning in and, and we'll see her next week. In the meantime, as you know, we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers when and where you can. And one easy way to do that is to visit our own Friends and Fiction bookshop.org page, where you can find Jeffrey's books and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. Of course, at bookshop.org, a portion of each sale through the Friends in Fiction shop goes to support independent bookstores, and it also helps to support this show. So if you enjoy watching, this is a great way to support our guests, independent bookstores, and the Friends in Fiction group itself, all at the same time. Win, 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 guys. What more could you ask? That's yep, exactly right. And don't forget that our spring box is now available from our friends at Oxford Exchange. Order now and receive my book, The Wedding Veil, which comes out in 75 days, you guys. Like that's just, <laughs> not now that we're counting. Not that we're counting, days. We're counting but 75 days in March. <laughs> okay. um, Mary Kay's The Home Records, which comes out in May. I'm not exactly sure how many days. Sorry, Mary Kay. Um, <laughs> And a special Friends in Fiction notebook complete with sticky flags for marking all your favorite pages. And we are also a couple weeks into our very first Friends and Fiction reading challenge, which our friend, and I, I'm always so scared I'm going to say your name wrong, no matter how many times I've said it, <laughs> Anissa Armstrong has been sharing with you. Each month of the year, there will be a different reading prompt and we challenge you to not only complete all 12 months, but also keep track of what you've read this year. One way to do that is with our beautiful reading journal designed by us in conjunction with the independent bookstore, Oxford Exchange. And this month is debut books. And I have loved watching on the Friends in Fiction page as everybody has started to talk about the debuts they chose, whether there are debuts or someone else's and sharing them. Some people are reading way more than one debut and it's, yeah. it's so much fun to watch. But our reading journal has plenty of space to record your thoughts on what you're reading and to write about it. And I know a lot of you have been posting on the page asking, where can I find the, the what's next month? We always keep the whole sheet that Sean just popped up of all the months pinned to the top section of the Facebook page. And also it is on our website. Great. Well, so exciting. I, have, I mean, I'm loving it. I'm loving seeing everyone reading yeah. and um, I'm loving my journal. I like just filled out my first entry. For Did the you year. really? What was your first entry? 
great. Um, it was a book called The Sunshine Girls that actually does not come out until like May. Mm, actually, maybe even later than that. It was something that I blurbed, but I loved it. It was okay. great. So, um, what was your first entry, Kristen? Um, oh my gosh, it was also something that I just finished recently and I am drawing a blank right now because that's how my brain's working today. And I know, like, I all, know, all I thoughts have gone out of it. I just read something and it's like, mm, yes. Know. No, it's terrible. Okay, it's terrible. Have you um, your my, yep, my first entry, and I'm so excited to finally have a place to write it, is uh, The Lincoln Highway. Was oh, my first oh, oh, oh yeah, Eight More Tools, yeah. Yeah, it was the last book of 2011 that kind of, you know, it's this big, mm -hmm. so. It yep. rolled over oh, and just went awesome. So it's my first. It's not a debut though, but I will. I'll I'll yes. read a debut this month. Me too. Well, now let's welcome our guest for the evening, Jeffrey Deaver. Jeffrey is an international number one best-selling author of 45 novels. 45. 45. <laughs> That's a lot of novels. Yeah. Forty People magazine has called the master of ticking bomb suspense. Jeffrey's novels are sold in 150 countries and have been translated into 25 languages. He has served two terms as president of the Mystery Writers of America and was recently named a Grand Master of MWA, whose ranks include Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen, Mary Higgins Clark, and Walter Mosley. That is some esteemed company right there. Wow. No kidding, right? So his novel, The Bone Collector, which marked the debut of his fictional sleuth, Lincoln Rhyme, was made into a feature film by Universal Pictures, starring Denzel Washington and Angelina Jolie. And I actually, I think I saw that in the theater back in 1999. I, I remember that that, uh, that movie so well, seeing it at the time. Um, NBC <laughs> also, yeah, NBC also recently aired the nine-episode primetime series, Lincoln Rhyme Hunt for the Bone Collector. So um, we are certain that you've, seen this series, seen this movie um, fairly recently. So Jeffrey graduated from the University of Missouri and has a JD degree from Fordham University. In his free time, Jeffrey enjoys cooking and hosting dinner parties, which we hope he'll invite us to after <laughs> we have him on the show. So <laughs> hopefully after tonight, we'll get invited to a dinner party. That and now, so now he's just right up the road in Chapel Hill, like, you know, right? Maybe this <laughs> is the goal. <laughs> all right, Sean, let's bring Jeffrey on. Hello, all. Hi. Hi Jeffrey. Oh, my goodness. It's so good to see you. And let me just say, uh, the Friends absolutely <laughs> applies, um, but you don't have the word enthusiastic in your title. So I think you should now call yourself enthusiastic friends and fiction because you clearly are. You love books, you love authors, yeah. and you love to write. Me I can too. tell that as well. And you love to laugh. And uh, I'm in my kitchen right now. If I was not afraid of like disrupting the entire, I've got that one of those ring lights up and everything. I would show you my my uh, panoramic kitchen, which is like five by five feet. It's not that panoramic. But um, anyway, here I am. And I do a lot of writing here. And, and in fact, you're going to get a look at my page proofs for my the book I'm finishing oh, right now. Oh, that's great. That. Copyright, oh copyright 2022, Jeffrey Deaver. So you can't, you can't steal <laughs> that's it. That's awesome. Can you, can, can you let us read it when we come to the dinner party you're going to invite us to? Sadly, I will. Uh, you need entertainment. I will read it aloud throughout the entire dinner. It is. It is uh, one thousand. It is a hundred thousand and ten words. So wow. it might be a long, might be a serve, long dinner party. I, 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 I hope you're planning a lot of courses. Oh, wine. I serve wine. Wine, yeah. wine like a ten good. course dinner. I like no, it. After All the, right. With my, with the wine I serve after the first course, you're not going to care one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> it's my kind of dinner party. This is the best dinner cocktail. We're good. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Jeffrey. We're so glad Thank to you. have you here. Thank you. So, The Midnight Lock is the 15th in your long running Lincoln Rhyme series. And mm -hmm. we would love it if you would tell us what Lincoln and his partner slash wife, Amelia Sachs, are up to this time around. Sure, I'd love to. And let me, let me just say this my job is to scare the socks off my readers. Um, uh, you do uh, I, have a, I have yep. a template for my. Uh, my books, I call it a formula and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I create a product. I'm not ashamed to say that. Um, and the template is this, the books take place over a very short period of time. They have uh, lots of twists and turns, reversals inside. They have a surprise ending. After that, there's a surprise ending. And following that, there's a surprise ending because I love, I, I love those love those surprise endings. Uh, but, and I love Lincoln and I love Amelia, but you know, truth be told, what's the most fun to create? The villains. And I'm yeah. always looking for um, very nasty kinds of villains that are not, you know, I've, I've read 
some supernatural, some occult. I've written some occult, but I actually like the villains who we could actually meet in real life. I think those are uh, more frightening. And when we talk about kind of putting together some ideas, maybe some suggestions about writing later, uh, we want a really intense emotional response. So, um, and your, your viewers out there have to understand, I, my books are more concise than my discussion. So I, I will get to the point now and answer your, your <laughs> no, little question. A few years ago, I was uh, locked out of my house. I left the keys inside and I uh, got back and I, uh, I called uh, a locksmith to come, uh, come to my house. And uh, uh, he, he took out these tools. Well, first, after verifying it was in fact my house because people have done that, you know? Uh -huh. and, and so he, he took these tools out and like in 10 seconds in the house. And that was uh, good for two reasons. One, my dogs were locked inside and it was time to feed them. So they were happy that I had gotten inside. But number two, I had the idea for my next book. And that was the, uh, that became the midnight lock. And to make it the idea very, uh, very brief, uh, my nefarious villain known as the locksmith is someone who breaks into people's houses after midnight, uh, of course, and while they're asleep and you think, oh, he does terrible things. He kills them. He's a serial killer or he does ta nasty things. No, he doesn't do anything. The worst thing he does is have a, a ham sandwich sitting in a chair next to the bed watching somebody sleep and then he gets up and leaves. Well, what's the effect of that? he has destroyed that person's life for the next who knows how long. They have to move from the apartment because he is, it has invaded their space. Yeah. Lincoln Rhyme and Amelia Sachs get on the case trying to track this guy down. And as in all of my books, we unpeel layers. Uh, not all is what it seems to be. In fact, nothing is what it seems to be. And we get closer and closer to the truth that involves a big media empire, a la secession. Uh, it involves a QAnon kind of blogger, uh, and at the end, uh, all of this comes together with one of those surprise endings followed by another surprise ending and so forth. And all I can say is I apologize to anyone who reads it because you're going to be sleeping with your lights on from now on. Oh, wow. well, it, it was sort of mean because sort of recently we had a, a locksmith and um, my son was with me and this locksmith came and changed our locks and he left and my son was like, mom, I think that was creepy. And I was like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, oh, well, Chrissy, you have to. Yeah, this this book will definitely do it. Oh, boy, no. I have to tell you oh, another story. I was on like chapter course, one, oh. and I was like, oh god. <laughs> Read it if you dare. Oh, but I have to say this. Uh, of course, I like to do my research, and we can, again we can talk a little bit about technique later. But I love doing research, and uh, you know, I think we're all authors, and don't one of the reasons you became an author, right, is because you have an innate curiosity, and you like to learn things. You research all your, your books. And, you know, we, it's so much fun to impart facts to readers because they love to learn things. I, as a reader, do as well. Well, of course, you think I'm going to try not to pick locks while I'm writing this book? <laughs> I bought I bought a set of lock picks, picks, which, by the way, where I live is legal. Anybody out there, you better check the law. But generally, it's, it's okay. You know, they're legal to buy. Uh, you can't break into somebody else's house with them. That's a bad thing. But uh, <laughs> so I thought, well, it took this guy 10 seconds to break in to my house. Or I shouldn't say break in to open the lock. I, I'm sure I could do it in, 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 give me a half hour. Two and a half hours later wow. with these, these little things. Wow. And after some, I still couldn't do it. And after some words, which I will not repeat here, and I didn't want to expose my dogs to, they shouldn't hear things like that. I just gave up. And uh, but I, I knew the technique. It's just I'm kind of a klutz. So I couldn't, you know, it's, it's very fine work. So I, uh, wow. uh, but I but I did the research. And if, if anyone out there wants to buy a set of lock picking <laughs> tools, just email me, please. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I, I love how want those lock picking tools, you're going to creep me out. So don't. <laughs> Do it. Exactly. Yeah. Let, let us let us know who from among our group orders them, Jeffrey, just okay. so we know to All be right. on the lookout. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about um, your research. I actually think that the most brilliant book I ever decided to write was one set in champagne so that I would really just have to drink a lot of bottles of champagne to acclimate myself to, you know, to what I was writing about. So that, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a tough job, but somebody's got to Someone's do it. Someone's got to do it. I mean, and, uh, you know, if, the sacrifices it, we make. Well, and I, I wrote a book a, a little while ago uh, called The Cutting Edge uh, about the diamond district in New York City. And, uh, you know, we've all heard about blood diamonds. This was about something other than that. And, uh, you know, when I, I, I research um, uh, all sorts of stuff like data mining, I look at that. 
I've researched um, uh, the uh, vanished man was about illusion and magic. So I researched that. And so I had to research the diamond industry. And uh, so I was in New York and I, I, I had been known to bring my girlfriend, uh, you know, who knows what, a bottle of wine, for instance, or maybe some, uh, you know, delicious candy or something. And she pointed out that my research in the diamond district did not result in any <laughs> present for her. I have yet to live that one down. <laughs> oh, man. Understandable. My goodness. Okay. So, Jeffrey, Lincoln is such an interesting and popular character. And he's obviously been a huge hit with readers from the start. So, I imagine a lot of fans were introduced to him through the Denzel Washington film, The Bone mm -hmm. Collector, which, as I sure. said, I mean, it's been years since I've seen it. And I still remember it so vividly. It was such a such a good film. Um, it, but I, I'm curious to know why you think that character in particular appeals to and resonates with viewers and readers as much as he does. I mean, I think that's one sure. of the the building blocks, one of the keys, really, no pun intended, with the lock breaking, <laughs> um, to, to having to having a series that's this long running and this successful. Um, a, oh, yeah, ahead, so I know I, I was just going to say, so what, what do you think it is that's so appealing about him? I have thought so much about that. And for the viewers who are not familiar, and of course, I think many people are familiar with the story, but uh, those who aren't, Lincoln Rhyme uh, was head of the New York City uh, forensics unit, the crime scene thing. And uh, then he was injured on the job, became a quadriplegic, not a paraplegic, quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. And I wrote the book uh, because of this. Uh, you know, I'm always looking for different sorts of things. Maybe you've heard the old saw about Hollywood, that when a producer is looking for a, um, a product to, to turn into a movie, that's a book or a short story, to turn into a movie, he or she wants something that has been wildly successful in the past yeah. and has never been done before. And we, we laugh because yeah. that's, that's Hollywood like, different. but, but it's, but it's very true. And so I take that to mean uh, that that formula I talked about earlier, the fast paced um, uh, story, the twists and turns, the reversals, the hook, uh, the, the theme that I, I like to uh, put in the, the story as well. That's my trademark. That's never going to change. But I have to bring something new to it. And I thought, this is going back over 20 years, what can I bring to my readers that will be new and exciting? Because this is all about readers. It's not about me. Yeah. You know, I write for my readers. I want to give them something happy and fun. And I thought, well, ah, I have it. I had just seen a thriller movie. And I'm not going to, uh, you know, with all respect to Tom Cruise and Bruce Willis, the, who doesn't love thriller movies? They're fun. Yeah. Explosions, car chases, you know, the James Bond stuff. Uh, gunfire. But then we get to the end and the bad guy is beating up the Tom Cruise, our hero, or the Bruce Willis character. Is there any doubt in anybody's mind that although he's bloodied and he's down, he will suddenly have a recovered memory that his father taught him to kickbox when he was five years old? Yeah. Oh my goodness, dad, you've come back to, in my memory. And he kickboxes the guy out the window. And these thrillers are always set on cliffs. So the bad guy has to fall off a <laughs> Cliff, and then we go to the, oh, then, we go to the then, right then we go to the credits. Well, who doesn't love that? I love that too. But I thought it's that's like junk food. That's like that's yeah. like popcorn. Wouldn't it be more enduring to have a character like Sherlock Holmes or Agatha Christie in the modern day who had to outthink the villain, who yeah. uh, didn't shoot them, who didn't karate kick them? And I thought, well, I'm going to um, create a character who did not have the option to shoot or to karate kick. He was um, simply his mind. And that is Lincoln Rod. And I thought it was a good idea for a one-off book. And then um, uh, it, it was uh, published and I got, I was working on something else. And my agent got a call from uh, Denzel Washington's agent and said uh, he wanted to do the, um, wanted to do the, uh, the movie and, and advice to everybody out there who's writing, if Denzel Washington calls you up and says he wants to do your movie, say yes. Don't even debate. Okay, there's, there's get, no advice, debate. get advice. I don't think that's advice no. we need, but oh, yeah. Okay. All right. okay. Yeah. Just, just <laughs> want to reinforce that. But, but, but in, in answer to your question, uh, that's where the, the character came from. But then he became more and more popular. The movie certainly helped, but people then started to buy the books. And I'll tell you, I think this is why he's so uh, successful and enduring that he, like all of us, is his mind and his heart and his soul before he is his physical incarnation. Yes. And that's true of all of us. You know, we, we all get older. We may, oh, I don't know, some people have lost their hair. I don't know who, but maybe some people have done that. 
and, <laughs> yeah. and we're not we're not in we're not in such good shape as we would like to be. But yeah. we always have our our mind yeah. uh, with us, and so that's why there's an every man or every woman aspect about him. And uh, he, again, I write for the audience. People want Lincoln Rhyme. They're going to get Lincoln Rhyme. I love, I love it. Love that. Oh my gosh, what a great analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm also curious because you've now spent so many years writing this character, right? I mean, you've, you've spent mm -hmm. so much time with him. How has he changed during the time you've been writing him? But also, how has he changed you? How has writing him changed who you are as a person during the time? Sure. Oh, very, him? very. You guys are great. Best question. We're here for three hours, right? Can we do that? No. <laughs> three and a half. Great question. Three and a half. Three and a half. Oh, we'll, we'll be okay. done by midnight. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, uh, when well, the locksmith comes. <laughs> oh, very good. Um, how how has uh, he changed? Well, I'll tell you how he's changed in in one sense. Uh, and I, I will say this: I listen to feedback a lot. I am a, a manu. I'm Procter and Gamble. I'm a manufacturer of a product, as I mentioned earlier. Nothing to be ashamed about that. I want to get the consumer product into the hands of uh, the folks who who want it. And I listen to feedback. Critics, not so much. Often, critics just want to hear themselves right and be cute and clever. But fans have no interest in doing that. They want to express their opinion to you, good and bad. Yeah. And the first books dwelt much more on his physical condition because that's a very valid theme uh, about uh, the difficulty of being someone who is severely disabled. Um, now, as medical science has gone on, his condition is improved. His condition parallels uh, science. And I found readers were more interested in the, the plots that I created. And I'm a very plot-driven author. Uh, we can talk a little about that later again uh, when I talk maybe about technique and so forth. Um, and I think the readers were more interested in that. So what has happened is uh, I don't deal quite so much with what I call with all affection, the soap opera elements of the, of the story, but with the, uh, the, the traction of the plot, get in there, solve it, move quickly. And, uh, and how has he changed me? Um, not so much, actually. I'm quite distant from my characters. I've heard some authors oh, wow. say that they they connect with their authors. They have a relationship with them. I think the best way I can put it is uh, someone asked me once if I'm when I'm writing a story and a, a character, uh, you know, kind of breaks out of the role I have created for him or her. Uh, how do you run with that? And I say, I don't. I kill them. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Well, there you it's go. my story. It's my story, not theirs. I mean, and, writing uh, tip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. There's a good writing tip. Yeah, a character gets out of line, shh, they're gone. Uh, no, that's not to say if you write a good character, uh, they might have a role in a different story. But yeah. for for this particular book, uh, it's it's my book, and um, they have to toe the line. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's kind of hard to live that way in real life, but. <laughs> um, that's that's how we can write crime books though right yeah right <laughs> i just want to switch gears for a minute and talk about short stories mm -hmm. because before we came on we were talking about that last year you had out two books and three short stories is that what you said uh, we did four short stories last year wow, I, oh, I, wrote, wow. I wrote i wrote i wrote for one will be published in 2022 i mean holy moly macaroni i mean i have written um, two short stories in my day, long form short stories. Mm -hmm. And I fear them more than I do the full length novel. Mm -hmm. um, don't y'all? I yep. mean, there's, there's something yep. intimidating about those short stories. So talk to us a little bit about why you do the short stories and how it feels sure. different for you. Is it a challenge to switch gears that way? Sure. Um, I love I love short stories. I have written. Do um, you? Okay. I, I know they, they can be difficult, uh, challenging to some people. I've written uh, quite a few, about 80 short wow. stories. I have three co <laughs> three collections published and three collections that have not been published. And these the ones I'm writing right now have not yet appeared in a in a, uh, a collection. And uh, if anyone's interested, of course, you know, shameless self-promotion, you can go to yeah. jeffreydeaver.com. But I also, the, the stories I've been doing lately have been on uh, with Amazon, Amazon original uh, stories. And... Um, what is there about short fiction? I, I think it's this, and I, I will say this, when I teach my writing course, some students come up sometimes and say, well, I've written a short story and I'm thinking of turning it into a novel and this will be a way to start. And I say, no, it's not. 
uh, a short story. You, what you may have done is written an outline or an idea that will become a novel, but a, um, a short story is a very different, um, a very different animal. And I think I can explain it this way best. A novel um, presents enduring characters, rich characters that we fall in love with, our heroes, and evil characters whom we despise. Uh, and the author has to uh, create that um, emotional connection between author and, um, and reader with, with, these, with the vehicle being the characters. A short story is different. A short story is a sniper's bullet. A short story exists for one thing and one thing only. And I'm speaking of myself. Um, that is the twist, the gut-wrenching twist at that. the end. And I'll give you I'll give you a very fast uh, example of kind of. Does not have to be fast. I'd love an example. This is awesome. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. No, we are. Um, you have the floor. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is you. All right. Uh, here's a short story I wrote. This is going to give away the the plot, but you know there are plenty more, as I mentioned, plenty more to choose from. <laughs> okay, there's another so, seventy nine. Here's, <laughs> here's the uh, here, here's the scenario. There's a, a high school girl who is the um, a target of a stalker, also in her class. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, young man is uh, troubled. He never touches her, never does anything to her, but he stares at her all the time. Ooh. In school, when she uh, walks home from school, stays on the sidewalk, which is legal, outside her house and looks uh, into the house and the father runs her off, but he comes back and uh, she's clearly troubled. Then one day she says uh, to her father, oh my God, dad, um, come look. And her, her bedroom windows open and uh, the uh, her, her uh, you know, her dresser drawers open and her clothes have been picked through. And the father, you know, she's sobbing and the father breaks. He snaps and he, he takes his golf club and uh, goes to the boy's house. And when the boy comes out, he kills him. Well, he's go he goes to jail for this. But, you know, he's a hero because he has protected his daughter. He had this moment of... Uh, you know, absolute, um, uh, you know, absolute psychosis. And uh, the final scene is where the, um, uh, the girl is in her room. She's been visiting with her father. She comes back and the mother comes to the door and says, um, honey, um, your, your golf instructor called and asked if you'd be interested in a lesson on Monday. And she says, no, I've learned all the golf I need to know. She had killed the boy herself to get her father put in jail because her father was very restrictive. He wouldn't let her go to the prom. He wouldn't let her date because oh, he was wow. worried about this guy. And so she, she puts the corsage, that's what they call the little corsage, corsage on her wrist. And she's going out on a date after she has put dad in prison for life. Now, <gasps> oh, now, my you know, gosh. How do you think of these things? I am, I am sick and twisted. I, I <laughs> But you see, we don't like anybody in it, but we like the twist. And because it's a short story, we don't have anything invested in the characters. We don't need to like them. They can all be bad. And uh, Ooh, so that's uh, that's just a, a, a fun thing to uh, a fun thing to do. Ah, I love oh. that. What a cool insight. That's Thank incredible. You. That's really good insight. Yeah. See, this is why I'm not good at short stories. I'm going to have to... I'm too worried if you yeah. like them and you're, you're too interested nice. in them. Oh yeah. well, I knew, I knew you, I knew you three were nice people. You got to work on that. Yeah, we mean, <laughs> a real flaw. It's a real flaw. We'll, we'll practice privately. Not being nice. <laughs> Any of you play golf? I'm just curious. No, no. I, I did play miniature golf today. I not yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not, that's not, that's not a murder weapon. <laughs> Well, the villain in this book, The Locksmith, seems to have a timely love-hate relationship with social media and the internet and its seemingly subversive effect on contemporary American life. Would you say that that's a bit of editorializing on your part? Uh, very, very good uh, perception. Uh, my books are, are thrillers. They move very quickly. Um, I, they're uh, novels that I want people to enjoy. But I also want at the end of the novel, when they close the last page, to have a little bit to chew on, a little bit to think about. And uh, for instance, my book, The Broken Window, about data mining, the dangers of data mining. And frankly, I was there eight, eight or nine years ago uh, before we know what's what's been going on uh, recently when you know Facebook was still uh, a gleam in Zuckerberg's eye. Well, it was actually, it was, biz it was in existence then, but I kind of sensed something was going on there. Well, um, 
I have been aware of, um, you know, um, the, 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 the dangers of what we uh, put out there uh, into the world. And uh, I don't want to give too, uh, the reason I'm hesitating is this is a, a plot that uh, kind of a, an explanation for one of the plots. But I will simply say that when you read this book, you will understand how careless we have become about sharing our lives on the internet with, uh, you know, I was going to say hundreds of thousands, with millions yeah. of, uh, of people. I, I, I create a fictional uh, video platform, kind of like YouTube, and uh, my, my villain is a content moderator. Now, I was not aware of content moderators before, this, uh, before I started researching this book. And it's quite a fascinating job. These uh, men and women spend long days watching videos. They have algorithms that kind of help them, uh, you know, direct the bad, um, the bad uh, videos to them. And they either uh, they say, well, you know, put it behind a, a screen that says uh, for adults only or simply ban it completely and erase it and then sometimes ban the account of the um, uh, of the poster. But uh, the the amount of material out there is astonishing, and I'm, I'm misquoting it. I could look in the book and find out, but I'm, I'm gonna. This is a rough idea. If you were to um, sit down with YouTube and watch every video, you yourself watch every video that was currently on YouTube, you would be watching ten thousand years worth of videos, and that doesn't even count what's going to be posted uh, posted tomorrow. So all of this material uh, has kind of a numbing effect on folks who watch it. And, uh, you know, is it a cautionary table, tale? Well, to some extent it is, but I think it was uh, Samuel Goldwyn, the film producer said, uh, you know, if, if you're gonna uh, send a message, go to Western Union. And, uh, you know, it's not your job to get on a soapbox, but I think it's, it's our, it is our job, maybe not to sell a political point, but to enhance the book, to enrich it by giving it some depth. And I, so I do look at social issues and uh, people could draw their own conclusions from that. But certainly social media is not necessarily uh, an enemy, but what is an enemy is the um, uh, you kind of the travesty that uh, has been uh, has, that journalism has become in certain circles. I went to the University of Missouri Journalism School, as, as you mentioned, and uh, that's traditional journalism like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the uh, the network network news certainly there's a bias in, in some lean some way some lean the other way but there there is a core of well known journalistic ethics that involves getting attribution uh, checking multiple sources giving the other side a chance to comment if yeah. one person says one thing and uh, the um, I, I've been aware of a kind of a uh, you know a, a cavalier attitude about that and a weaponization of the media. And uh, again, I'm hesitating because th th there are a lot of plots in the book that deal with that. I don't want to give too much away. But in answer to your, a long answer to your short question is, yes, there are some uh, uh, some broader issues that are uh, that are dealt with. That's amazing. That's great. And um, and you sort of answered the second part of my question. So that's great. But I was going to tell you, I, I went to journalism school at Chapel Hill. And right. Yes, favorite, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. One of our favorite lines was, um, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very much, you know, sort of brought up on that same sort of like, check everything. Well, or if your mother says you're in trouble, you don't have to get an attribution for that. You're, in, <laughs> you're sure that's true. <laughs> Well, I want to go back just for a minute to research because mm -hmm. I read that you routinely spend eight months researching a book. So if you're putting out a book a year and two books this year and you have such intricate plots, you know so much about mm -hmm. whether it's data mining or social media or locksmith, talk to us about the writing process with the research. How do you... Okay. Meld those if you're spending so long doing the research. Sure. Well, in preparation for this, I had jotted down a few of the uh, a distillation of my writing course, just a few points. And this gives me the chance to jump in with what I think is maybe the most important. And you have to understand, I'm not telling other people to do this. I'm simply saying this is what has worked for me mm. and I'm comfortable with it. Uh, and the research is part of it. But more important is the outlining. Um, the world is divided 
into two sorts of writers, the plotters and the pantsers. Yep. The plotters are those who plot and outline. The pantsers are those who go by the seat of the pants. Uh, one is not right or wrong. I, however, am only comfortable outlining. And I do recommend to my students that um, they know where they're going before they start. Um, uh, Joyce Carol Oates said, you can't write your first sentence until you know what your last sentence is. Oh, and wow. I, firmly, I firmly believe that. And so we'll talk about how I approach it. Now, I am a pathological outliner. I know no one else in the world that outlines this much. And I'm not, obviously, I'm not recommending it. I'm simply saying this is what works for me. And so I come up with an idea for a book. And I may have a great bang up first chapter, but I don't write it. I put, keep that in my mind. And then I, I start outlining the book. And um, I spent eight months doing that and the research. And when I say outlining, I start with, uh, a big bulletin board with uh, post-it notes. And uh, I'll put a, a note here. Okay, you need a murder here. Okay, a clue here that explains the revelation here. I'm not, you know, imagine this is the board. I put, put this up. I do that for probably three months. And then, oh, I, uh, wow. then I move to the computer and keep outlining it. And I'm doing the research. And the research informs the outline. It informs my, my plot. And uh, so finally, at the end of that eight months, I have a uh, the, the Midnight Lock outline was 140 pages or so. It's just the outline. Oh and I had I had a couple hundred pages of research uh, as well. Now, and then I sit down and, and write the book. Now, I'm going to explain why the outline, why I feel the outline is important. Wait, wait, before you talk, oh, sure, go further. Sure. Do it, you can post it later, but I would love to see a picture of your bulletin board with the stickies and the outline. Have you oh, ever okay. taken a picture of it? I, I I may have one. I'm actually at the point now where I'm writing the book, so the stickies have come down, so it's oh. a blank bulletin board. But I but I can certainly, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a website, uh, you know, uh, Friends of yes. Fiction, so I can send a picture of that, so. Oh, we'd uh, love to see it. Okay, because, sure. Yeah. Now, now, I'm cool. gonna, now I'm gonna sell outlines. And I don't know whether your <laughs> pants is your platters, but I'm gonna sell outlines. I'm gonna tell you, uh, there are several reasons why there should be outlines. And I'm going to say um, say this. Uh, have you ever read a book that should not be written? Yes, of course we have. Yes. <laughs> and I'll tell you how that happens. Let's say you come up with a brilliant idea for a, a set piece beginning. That chapter one, that is incredible. It is, uh, by set piece, I mean an action piece, a very emotional scene. It may not necessarily have anything to do with the uh, with a crime. It could be an emotional uh, set piece beginning, two characters talking and bonding or fighting or something like that. But it is a scene that is fantastic. And you sit down and you write it and bang, that scene comes out just like that. And you go to set chapter two, you keep going, the energy's up chapter three, chapter four, chapter four slows down a little bit. You're not quite sure what these characters are going to do, going to do chapter five, slower yet, chapter six, stop. You don't know what's going to go on. And you, you're looking at the rest of the book. Now you've written 150 or 200 pages of very good prose because you're a good writer. Uh, you can put the words together, but you're looking at um, a, a, a middle and you, the dreaded middle. What are you going to put in there? And then your end, your big surprise ending, and every book has to have a big surprise ending. There's none there. You don't know what to do. Yeah. And so you, um, uh, you, think, you think about it for a while and all you can come up with is uh, cliches, for the, the middle of the book, you know, the detective and his captain have a fight and the detective has to give up his badge and gun. Have we ever seen that before? Yes, <laughs> a, thousand, a thousand times. And then the end, you know, the, the villain uh, comes out of left field. We never met the, the villain before. And uh, you were then presented with two choices and you're gonna kind of figure out how I feel about this. One is the um, morally cowardly, reprehensible, intellectually dishonest thing and fill that story with cliches and tack on that terrible ending <laughs> and put that out for your readers. And that's a sin. Why? Because the readers are our gods. We owe them everything. We cannot give them a readers substandard are product. Our gods. I love exactly. that. Exactly. Well, now, or choice two, which you've probably gathered is the morally honorable, uh, ethical, intellectually honest thing and throw out every damn page. Um, because it's not going to be a book. And if you wrote a good, uh, you start on something else. If you've written a good uh, chapter one for a bad book, think of the chapter one you'll write for a good book. Now, imagine this. You come up with that great set piece beginning. And you don't write it down except on a little tiny post-it note. And it says, good set piece beginning. 
and you put that in the upper left-hand corner of your uh, bulletin board, and then you keep putting other Post-it notes down, and you say, hmm, there's no book here. It's a good start, but there's no book here. You wad up those Post-it notes, throw it out. You've wasted a week, 10 days, and uh, you move on to something else. That's why I outline it. I also outline because um, it tells you where there's – this. If, if you have an outline, if you create the outline, you're never going to have writer's block because you'll be you'll be blocked and troubled when you're creating the outline, but you come to the, the middle part with a post-it note there that says, and the uh, the detective discovers clue X, Y, Z. Oh, where, where do I go from there? Well, it doesn't matter. Forget about it. Put, put a post-it note way down at the bottom that says the love interest has a fight with the detective and you move on to that. And then you'll come back to yep. that. But think if you have to write that in prose, you go back and rewrite and rewrite yep. and rewrite. Uh, ultimately, I'm extremely, I'm an extremely lazy person. I don't want to have to do that. So <laughs> it I do not sound that way. I think. Well, I, I, just do the, I do the work up front. Let's put it that way. It's got to be done. The, a book is about a, a novel is about structure. I'm talking about crime, commercial crime fiction. It's about structure as much as, or even more than, fine lyrical prose. Uh, mm. Plots count. Mm. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. they definitely do. And you do them very, very well. And now we know why. That's like, I feel like I just got a master class right there. That's I was going to say, I feel so inspired. I'm going to buy like a big poster board. I will have to say, Jeffrey, you're not going to like this, but my brain just can't do it. Like there's something about sitting at the page yeah. where like the story develops. But if I am sitting there trying to figure out what happens next and what happens next, like I can't. It's so uh, it, bizarre. It's, uh, uh, the world is divided into those two categories. Yeah. And, you know, there's some people like, let me name a few, uh, Stephen King, uh, George R.R. R. Martin, who wrote Game of Thrones, uh, Lee Child. They never outline. And, you know, if those guys keep at it, maybe someday they'll be successful. <laughs> maybe. Maybe, maybe people know their names. Yeah. Maybe so, if so, someone so, would tell them what, to outline, they can develop a <laughs> well, right, and it's what, what you whatever. said. You pay for it on one end or the other. You know, I pay yeah, it's, for it as the gotta end. Be, it's it's got to be done. That's all there is to it. And I would say to beginning writers, uh, just follow Joyce Carol Oates' suggestion. Don't do a, a long outline. Just try it. Just yeah. come up with a, Have an idea of where you want the story to end up and then yeah. work backwards from there. Yeah. I like that advice a lot. Point. Well, yeah. we have got an audience out here that is just so excited that you're here. They're one, they're dying to see that bulletin board, but they have a million. Oh, questions. okay. I, I will, I, I will get that. I'll dig yeah. that up. Sure. Yeah. But we've got some great questions for you. Um, so Kristen, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. You know, we have just as many great comments as we have great questions. Yeah. So we've got um, Carolyn Clement McDonough saying, movie, TV show, dinner, if Denzel asks, it's a yes. I think in reference to you talking about <laughs> Denzel earlier. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Renee Herskowitz says, I love that Sax is such a strong woman. So that's a nice compliment. I, I, I feel the same. Yeah. Um, Marlene Waters is wondering whether your books have to be read in any particular order. So I know, obviously, um, this series, this is uh, book number 15 of the series, but mm. if we've, if readers have not read you before, can they dive in with this book or do they have to start earlier? No, the books are all self-contained. Um, and, uh, that's a challenge. And, uh, uh, you may write, uh, series, uh, books. It's a challenge to kind of, uh, provide sufficient information to new readers. So they understand the backstory, uh, and yet not bore, readers who are familiar with it. So it doesn't take a lot, a few paragraphs to kind of explain uh, the, the character, but no, I make sure they're all, uh, they're all self-contained. And I uh, do not really have an arc for the whole series. Okay. Um, it's, I think it's important uh, for uh, one to have a, an emotional experience with each standalone book. Oh, I like that. I like that thought. Okay, great. So Terry, I'm just going to read you a comment really quick. I love this. Terry Ziegler Randolph said, I have read all of your books, Jeffrey D. Oh, oh, my. Thank you. I Thank you. am a direct, and that's a lot of, that's a heck of a lot of books. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and she said, I am a director of a small library, so I always recommend all of your books to my mystery readers. Oh, oh thank you so much. That means the world know. to me. Like God bless life. our librarian. Uh, exactly. I do a lot of, well, when we were doing live events, I do a lot of fundraisers for libraries. I speak there and I, I hope that will come back. I, I think we're maybe 
heading out of this crazy time. We'll keep our fingers crossed. I keep yeah. saying that it doesn't happen, but yeah. okay. So Tammy Rose Dotson says, I liked the NBC show. Please tell me there will be more. Well, I hope so. Um, that hit just at the time. I, I think it, it aired in March of 2020 or April of 2020 when production shut down yeah. and um, you know, the ratings were good. I mean, like six, six seven million people, uh, a show yeah, but I count it. that as good. Yeah, yeah that's that amazing. Good. But, yeah. but who knows how Hollywood works? You know, it's a crazy thing. But I will tell you this. I write another series, a character named Coulter Shaw, uh, and he has appeared in uh, three books so far. Uh, and here's the fourth. Did I show you this show and tell, of course? <laughs> there we go. Oh, that yeah. gives the whole plot away. I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Uh, but he just gave up the twist on national television. <laughs> but um, uh, Culture Shaw will be, a, a, we've, uh, they're in production right now. It's a series for CBS done oh, by please. Ken Olsen, who did uh, This Is Us, 30 something. And uh, it's uh, uh, Culture Shaw in the Never Game, starring Justin mm -hmm. Hartley. That'll be out next year. We think. Oh. So, so that will be, that will be amazing. <laughs> Oddly, you know, let me just say, when I tell that to the, my guy friends, they say, oh, yeah, that's interesting. When I tell that to the women friends, they have a different response. I don't understand what's that about. Wow. That's, that's going to be a good it's one. It's not that complicated, Jeffrey. I can explain it to you later. Should I do some? If you, I'll, if you I'll, need I'll, me to explain it later, I will. No, don't worry. I'll research it. So. <laughs> Just Google it. It'll be fun. There you go. Um, well, Jeffrey, wow, you were such a fascinating guest. If you wouldn't mind sticking around for just a few more minutes, we have one additional question for you. But I first, just a few reminders from us. So everybody out there, just a super quick reminder. Well, it's not that super quick, to be honest. But um, don't forget about our Writer's Block podcasts. Um, not only will this show be a podcast, but every Friday we drop a new podcast under the writer's block with Ron Block and a new episode launches every Friday. Last week, Ron interviewed Thridi Omnigar, the author of the new Reese pick, Honor, a fascinating interview. And this coming Friday, our Kristen and Ron interviewed two authors about breathing life into history, Genevieve Graham of Bluebird and Julia Kelly, our friend of the last dance of yeah. the debutantes. So except for Wednesday nights, Fridays are my favorites because the new podcast always yeah. drops that day. Mm -hmm. And let me talk to you, please, about subscribing. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're hitting those subscription buttons, you can also subscribe. Sub if I say too many times, it's a tongue twister. You can subscribe to our newsletter and our YouTube channel so you never miss anything. And you can also find selected back episodes on Loco Plus, our new streaming platform. Yeah, I'm, I, thank you actually for mentioning the uh, the podcast that's coming this Friday. I completely forgot that one was about to air. It was such yeah. a great conversation with Julia Kelly, who we love, and Genevieve Graham, who I, I love too. I mean, they're both um, really skilled historical fiction writers, um, and they had a, a really interesting chat about how they work. So um, awesome. I hope you check that one out. Um, speaking of things to check out, if you are not hanging out with us yet in the Friends and Fiction official book club, you're missing out. We do hope you'll join us. Um, you know, we talk about about it every week but of course you probably know by now um, that group is separate from us it's run by our friends lisa harrison and brenda gardner who do a phenomenal job with it and there are more than ten thousand members which just blows us away so join them on january 24th when our friend wade rouse who writes as viola shipman will be joining them for an in-depth chat about his book the secret of snow so exciting. And make sure to join us for our next episode of Friends in Fiction next Wednesday, right here at 7 p.m., where we will welcome Jillian Cantor, the author of Beautiful Little Fools, and Jenny Judson and Danielle Mafood, the authors of The Last Season. Then on January 26th, we'll host Amor Tolls of the Blockbuster at the Lincoln Highway. If you're ever wondering about our schedule, it is always on the Friends in Fiction website and on the header graphic on our Facebook page. So, Jeffrey, you're up one last time. Um, one question that we always love to ask our guests and always get an interesting answer. Perfect. What were the values around reading and writing when you were growing up in your house? Um, I was a nerd when I was growing up. Uh, I mean, and, and not a, you know, now if you're a nerd, uh, you, you're worth a billion dollars because you've created a, a social platform for, <laughs> right. for cats dancing in costumes. 
Um, but I was a nerd when You're I uh, when it when it meant something. I was a Leave It to Beaver kind of nerd. Probably a reference you may not get, but it was of my oh, generation. We'll it. It was yeah, the old. <laughs> well, I said I said that once in a presentation, and this girl came up to me. And, uh, you know, she's in her uh, late teens or early twenties, and she said, "Mr. Deaver, Justin Bieber is not a nerd." Um, oh, no. So, so I, I had to, I, I had to explain it was something else. But but I was a nerd, and uh, but I, I, I had, um, I, and you know, I was uniformly ignored by the cheerleaders and pom pom girls, and I, uh, you know, on the on the sports teams in gym class when we divide up the. Um, the captains of each team would kind of plot like chess grandmasters to make sure I ended up on the other guy's team. Yep. I was so bad, but you know, none of that mattered because I had something I thought was more important. I had the Glen Ellen, Illinois public library, and that's where I would spend all my time. Um, and I, um, uh, you know, after school and on, on the weekends. And I, I, I just learned that books were so, so important. They would teach you things you did not know pre-internet days, of course, things you would have no way of knowing in a small uh, Midwestern town, but you could be exposed to um, the uh, the wide world out there. And they they took you away from your, your daily cares. You know, you would get lost in a book and forget the fact that the cheerleaders and pom-pom girls ignored you. You could get, get into the uh, story, but they did something else that I, I found and I thought was so very important. Um, I don't know if any of you were ever the new kid in the schoolyard. Uh, or maybe oh, yeah. you were in the schoolyard and you saw a new kid there. And, you know, children are generally uh, excruciatingly shy and uh, they would be looking down and feeling lonely. But then they would notice somebody across the schoolyard who was holding a copy of uh, maybe Little House on the Prairie yeah. or The Hobbit. And you could walk up to them and say, uh, you know, you didn't make eye contact, but, you know, you, <laughs> you, you, hey, you get to the dragon part there. What, what was that? Uh, did you just read that thing about Paw? And suddenly, even though you didn't know that person, yes, you did know them. You bonded, and you made friends because of books. And uh, I knew then that I wanted to be a, a, a full-time, full-time author. And I, I started writing at a very early age. It was, you know, just uh, not, not, not any good. But it, it, it didn't matter. I knew I would move in the direction of writing, uh, uh, writing stories and uh, telling stories because they were such an important part of my my early life. That's amazing. That's wow. I, I think it's safe to say that you came out on the other side of that better off than if those pom pom girls had, <laughs> right. yeah. or if you had been picked for the sports team. Yeah, so. I mean, if you'd been picked first for the sports team, you probably would not be on Friends and Fiction right now. And then oh. where would you be? Then Jeff? what would your I mean, life be? We know this I, is I, a highlight, I, you know. Yeah. I clearly would be a like a line. You can't really see me, a linebacker. I'm not yeah. built like a football uh, player. <laughs> I have to say, but. Uh, Hilarious. Well, we have had such a good time with you tonight, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for spending your it's, night with us and sharing your beautiful stories. And somebody just said, I bet those pom-pom girls and cheerleaders are sorry they ignored you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you go. It's like that gar wait, Toby Key song. How do you like me now? That's right. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. But thank you so much for being here. And we look forward to re reading your next amazing novel and catching up on those short stories. All right. and, well, and we, been, we're excited about the dinner party too. Oh, okay. Yeah. We've got. I'm, I'm going to go shopping tomorrow, and uh, <laughs> well, we may have to wait a little while for that dinner party. But I actually do like dinner parties. I've got a very big uh, dining room, and I, I love to cook, and I, I think it will be uh, great fun. And actually, we could bring our cameras in. You can bring your cameras in. Well, something to think about in the future, maybe that could be a that some Wednesday, really some Wednesday, fun. some Wednesday night. So anyway, thank you all, <laughs> yes. and thank you, thank, thank you, you viewers, for for listening and. Uh, uh, all I can say is uh, I truly appreciate, on the behalf of all readers, your uh, appreciation for books. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, and thanks for being with us. Thanks. Bye, Jeff. Thank, thank you. Now, everybody out there, make sure that you stick around for our after show, and don't forget that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We're live there every week, just like we are on Facebook, and if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. Plus, you'll have special access to short clips that you can only find on YouTube. Be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Jillian Cantor of Beautiful Little Fools and Jenny Judson and Danielle Mafood of the last season. See y'all in a minute. See you next Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. 
We're so glad you're here. Hello, hello. That was great. That was great. He was such an interesting guest. And all I could think about was, I mean, not that I probably will, but if I ever write another historical fiction novel, like it makes so much sense to me, like why you outline, because you kind of know the story, like, especially if you're telling, if you're, you know, it's a real person and you know, like the interesting parts of their life story already and like kind of where you're going to go. I should have done that. That would have been. Oh my gosh. I'm going to pull out, I need to find the picture of my um, butcher block paper when I was writing mm -hmm. Becoming Mrs. Lewis, oh, wow. because it was two people who had a really intricate yeah. timeline, yeah. Joy and Jack. And so I had this huge butcher block, like it was really long. I taped it along the edge of this long table, sticky, 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 sticky. And I would just, I did exactly what he was talking about and not near as much to outline the story mm -hmm. as to make sure I knew the events in their mm -hmm. life. So I didn't mm -hmm. put them in the wrong. Oh, I could turn around yes. and look at it and say, oh, I can't talk about that yet. It hasn't happened yet. Like That's that kind so of thing. interesting. I'm a really extensive uh, plotter. I, I outline oh. very extensively. My outlines are like a quarter of the length of the finished book. Like they're very long, but yeah. I can't do it visually. Like I don't, that's just not the way my brain works. So I've never done like the post-its or the butcher paper or anything like that. Like it has to be in a word document so I can wrap my head around it. And then I turn that into something longer. It's weird. It's just weird how our, how we each it come is. at it from a, a completely different angle, but we ultimately wind up in the same place. Isn't that strange? Do you it's have so such a super organized mind too, that I can like really see like, you knowing, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. what's, you know, what's interesting about that though. It's, it's interesting. It's now I'm so like analyzing myself. I, I have a super organized mind, but all of the organization is here. None of my house is a mess. Like my bookshelf is a, like, there's nothing physical in my house. That's organized. Every organizational skill I have is here. <laughs> that's, well, that's where it needs to be. I that's think that's awesome. creative people. Don't you think that's creative people? I, creative I don't people. know. I don't is know. that like a is that like a too big of a generalization? It probably is, but I always hear that, and that I give myself, I let myself off the hook for that because I'm. It's just, it's not my life I, skill. I wish I could organize my actual life better, though. I, right. That that would be nice. I wish I was a better house cleaner. Listen, no, we things. only have. I was talking about this today. We only have yeah. so much headspace, right? Yes. So, yeah. right, like if if I'm gonna organize an entire house and organize an entire plot, yeah. I, I can't. I don't. I don't have enough hard drive. Well. So. You know, and then I think we started Friends and Fiction, and it's like my brain's just Whoa. been on o overload essentially for two years now. <laughs> there used to be like a little room left over for other things, and now there's just not anymore. Yeah. It's like book on one side, Friends and Fiction on the other, nothing yeah. else. Well, this is like the best segue ever into what I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight and what I wanted to ask you because um, – I was looking back, I keep these like very extensive like goal setting notebooks every year. So I have like my 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 yearly goals, my weekly, my monthly, my daily. I didn't even say that in the right order. See, no organization. <laughs> yeah. But it's like very, you know, broken down. And so it's amazing to like go to the end of the year and see, yeah. you know, what happened throughout the year that you like really tried to do. And then of course the things that you could never plan for in a million years, but you know sort of happened. And so the one thing, like I went back to 2015, which was the year Dear Carolina came out and I was looking at like the one, like at the things that I like really needed to double down on this year that I just never gotten a handle on. And, to, and every year I'm like, my house is going to be perfectly organized. And every year I perfectly organize my house. And then like eight days later, it's a disaster all over. Again. <laughs> yep. Or when I say like I, but the new year said, I'm going to do clean out one drawer a day. Yeah. That lasted three days. Oh, so yeah. this morning I woke up, I said, I have to do two drawers today <laughs> because I didn't do one yesterday and I didn't. So like it just two gets drawers in my closet are kicking. Do, do you ever just yeah. open them and you're like, ah. Like, I love when I do that, but it's only two drawers. Right? Yeah. But yeah. those two drawers look good. Well, but that brings me to do you have any reading goals for this year? I mean, we have this beautiful new reading journal out. We've got this super fun challenge that Anissa is running for us. Have you set reading goals? Do you set reading goals? Do you care? Do you like, what's your philosophy around reading? I have never set reading goals because mm -hmm. 
I read so much. Yep. Same. Right. So, so like, I don't, like I set goals for things that I don't naturally do. Right. Or that I would put off. So I'll set a goal, a drawer a day, or I'll set a goal, you know, make sure I do yoga three times a week or whatever my goals may be. But for something like reading that I do as naturally as yeah. breathing, I've never set reading goals. I, I am going to try and do our challenge though. So yep, um, same. I haven't picked my debut book yet because I was reading, um, I was finishing the Lincoln Highway, but um, yes, I, I, I'll, de I definitely want to do that. So I guess it's a reading goal. How about y'all? Yeah. I, I also don't set reading goals for the same reason because I'm constantly reading something and I, and I'm reading as much as I possibly can. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Again, back to like the time and the brain space, mm -hmm. but it's, it's an interesting, it's interesting that you ask that question today because, um, Jason, my husband and I were just talking today about how last night. Yeah, it was just last night. We had we it was a little chilly out. We had a fire pit out back. And so we decided because we had the fire pit going that we would sit by the fire for 30 minutes and read. Um and Noah loved it. Like no my Noah, my my little boy who's almost six. Um he's um he's a big reader, but I don't think we actively model reading for him as much as we should. And it's mm -hmm. not that we're not reading, it's just that like oftentimes we're reading on a Kindle or, you know, mm -hmm. I'm reading after he's gone to bed. Like I'm not conscious of setting time aside to do it. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of my reading goals for the year to read together separately as I a family, like, like, like to have a couple nights a week where we just for 30 yeah. minutes, everyone sits down and we're each reading our book. Cause I think that's important. I think it's an important part of modeling um, yeah. that this is something that brings me joy. Love that. How about I you? love that too. I love that too. Last year, um, we did not that same thing, but something kind of similar where like we would all sit on the porch. It was obviously, it was warm outside at that point. And we would sit on the porch and like, I would read. So like I was, I read um, Pat Conroy's The Losing Season, like to Will and Will. Um, and obviously I edited it a lot for um, language and some content. <laughs> God, <laughs> but, you said, shoot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was kind of like the perfect book because they were super interested in the sports aspect awesome. and I was super interested in just the beautiful writing. So it was like a really good you know, fit for all I of like us. that. Yeah. Yeah. Which we haven't, I mean, we haven't done it again, but we need to because it was, it was a really good experience. But yeah, I'm like you guys, I don't, specifically set reading goals too much, but I am, um, trying to make a really concerted effort to, um, read before bed. Cause I think sometimes, you know, like the day just kind of yeah. gets away from you. And by the time it's time for bed, it's like, let's just fall into bed. But I do think it helps me sleep better. And you know, all of those things when I can kind of unwind, although then of course I'm into the book and I'm like yep. flipping pages till two in the morning. Um, but I well, one of my goals too is because I've never done it. So like when people post, I read 52 books this year or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to do that. Mm -hmm. One of my goals is to write down the books I read. And even if I don't write a long mm -hmm. like analysis of it, just write whether I liked it, loved it, when I read it. So I am, do have a goal to do that. So in a couple months, you guys can check with me and see if I cleaned out any more drawers or yeah, wrote yeah. down my books. <laughs> We'll keep you honest. Sounds good. I think it was Ellen Hildebrand who said that that's a part of her writing day, that reading is a part of her writing day. Like she has, you know, like a certain mm -hmm. amount of time, which yeah. I think is amazing. Um, I'm not there, but I think it's a good goal to strive for, for sure. You know, and, and I think another good goal to strive for is reading more outside of our genres, which I, yeah. which yep. I think, which I think we all do naturally, particularly because we're hosting this show, right? Like a lot of the guests we have are not guests who write in our genre and we're reading their books. Um, but I always find I learn surprising things that I can apply to my own work in the places I least expect to learn them. Um, like him and, and I, like Jeffrey today talking about hundred yeah. percent. And, you know, he said a couple times, oh, well, you know, this is for people writing crime thrillers or, you know, some version of that. But, um, but, but it wasn't like the things he was saying were things that were specific to his genre, but could be applied to any of our genres also, because they were just about good storytelling. I, yeah. you know, yeah. I love how he That's said important. a surprise ending and then a surprise ending right. and then another surprise ending. I because love that concept. there, right? We like, yeah. I've got the great ending. But maybe yeah. there's another and another. Yeah. So yeah, that's funny because that really stuck with me too. I was like, hmm, maybe so. And I was thinking about the book that I'm writing right now, and yeah. like I'm I'm to the point where the finish line is close enough that I can I can see what the ending's 
going to be, you know, whereas before I wasn't really so sure. Um, and I'm like, is it surprising enough? You know, is it something yeah, that I just wouldn't expect? And, you know, a lot of things, of course, in like women's fiction, or not necessarily, but I guess in what I write, like a lot of it, like, you know, sort of what's going, some things that are going to kind of come together. But um, it's always nice to have something in there that readers don't yep. quite expect. Yeah, so. yep. absolutely. Yeah. All right, ladies, y'all are awesome. We miss oh, you, yeah. Mary Kay, but we can't wait to see you next week. Well, we'll Patty, I, I also quickly need to add that when Sean had us stacked on top of each other and your image was on top of mine, I kept looking over my shoulder to see what was burning. Cause like, I would see like oh. the flames, like that, like your, your flames were like sitting on top of my bookshelf. And like, I kept catching myself like, no, 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 wait, oh, it's, just, it's just Patty's. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I've had like five false fire alarms and like, the, there we <laughs> go again. I, I wanted to message you that you should host a like fireside reading. Hi, Henry. And maybe it could just be one of those, like, I can't remember what they're called, like SMR. What, what's the thing? With, like, the I know what you're talking lines. about. That's hilarious. You, you could just be sitting there reading your book with the crackling fire, like on a video, and that was all you need to do. I love it. Hilarious. Can I you guys it. hear it? Anyway, um, I will, I will, I will not have an, hopefully, I won't have to have it on next week. My office was freezing tonight. I could not get warm and I didn't want to sit here it's going, friends and fire and fiction. <laughs> oh, Sean. <laughs> oh, Sean, we love you madly. Oh, okay, Mary Kay, we'll see you next week. And y'all, thanks for being with us tonight. You guys are so awesome out there. Thanks Great for being day. with us. Great night, Great. ladies.